All right, so the title of my sermon this morning is How to Love One Another. How to Love One Another. A powerful passage in John 13 at the um, Last Supper when Jesus um, actually girds himself and washes his disciples' feet. Uh, interesting thing about that story is, you know, like when he washed his disciples' feet, you know who was sitting there as well? Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was sitting there. So you imagine him washing the disciples' feet. Not only did he wash his disciples' feet, he washed Judas' feet. Because it wasn't until after he washed his disciples' feet that he gave the stop to Judas. And then Judas went out to betray him. And knowing that that was going to be the last night uh, that his disciples were going to be with him, because after that he was going to get betrayed and uh, be crucified and, and rise again. Before his death, he commanded them to love one another. So as you think about this passage in John 13, where I'm focusing on today, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. So that's a very profound statement there when you think about it. Jesus is not just telling us to love one another how you think of love, how you think you ought to love each other. He's saying, no, no, in the way that I have loved you, this is how you ought to love one another. And we're going to see that today, like how Jesus loved us, you know, where he laid his life down for us. That is what he is talking about. But this also gives the context of that chapter. You know, where, he, where he's actually washing the disciples' feet. So you see how he is saying the way we are to love each other is we're not to think of each other better than one another, that we will not stoop to each other's level. He being Lord and Master of the universe, girded a cloth, took a basin of water and washed the feet of his disciples. Do you ever think about that? What Jesus did in that moment? Your feet, the dirtiest part. The one that touches the ground. You know, like, so think about when they go and the things that people would step on. You know, and how dirty their feet would be when they're wearing sandals and all that sort of stuff. And the Lord of the universe did not think it a strange thing to get down on his hands and knees, take a basin of water, and wash off the dirt. Not only of his disciples' feet, but of the feet of the one who betrayed him. And not only that, not only did Jesus wash his feet, but when Jesus went to the cross, you know he also died for that person's sins as well? Judas Iscariot's sins were on the cross when Jesus paid for them. It's just that Jesus, uh, Judas did not believe on him. That is the sort of love that is expected of us. So when you think, yeah, I'm pretty nice to people, we are far from where we should be striving to be. And that's why there's always a way to grow. And look at this. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have one, love one to another. When you think about how you identify a Christian, what do you think? Is it what they believe? Is it the fact that they are busy Sunday morning? No, is it the fact of how they dress? You know, some people say, like, well, Christians have a certain dress. They dress different to the world. They look different to the world. They talk different to the world. They enjoy different things to the world. And you say, hey, that's how I kind of identify a Christian. But is this what Jesus says? Is this how Jesus says we ought to identify a believer in him? He says, by this, what is this? The fact that you love one another in the way Jesus loved us. That's what ought to shine forth. See, so it's not, about your, it's not just about your appearance. It's not just about how you present yourself. It's not just about what you do as a Christian. How you are known as a Christian is how you treat other people. Right? How you treat other people. But if you never interact with anybody else, you know, if you're somebody that just sticks to themselves and you never reach out to anyone, never make friends, never do anything for anything else, you're missing the Christian life, right? That's why I say with people that are, you know, not so extroverted, 
not so good at social situations. You have to grow in that area, right? That's like a Christian saying, I don't read. You know, I'm not a reading person or I'm not, you know, I'm not a praying person. There are things in the Christian life that we have to grow in. And being a social sort of person where we can interact with other people and treat, you know, do things for other people is an area we have to grow in as Christians. Right? That's what, an area you have to grow in. You have to, be, you have to become somebody that is involved in other people's lives and wants to be a blessing to other people because this is how you are known. By this, that you love one another. But if you don't like interacting with other people, you will never be able to love one another, right? So that's why you have to grow in love. And when you grow in love, you will grow in how you interact with other people. And this is the way you are known as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, this is the way you ought to want people to know you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Look here in our Philippians 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So this is Paul now exhorting the Philippian church. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Look at this. Let each esteem other better than themselves. So you see, that was the example Jesus was setting in John 13. Even though he was Lord, he created these people. He's the Lord of the universe, right? They ought to bow down and worship him. He esteemed other better than himself. He was willing to serve them by washing their feet. Here's how you love other people. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So I've underlined other here and others because that is the emphasis of love. Love is not about you. Right? People are often very self-centered. Right? How things affect them, what they enjoy, what they like, what somebody did to them, people don't do anything for me. That's not a loving attitude, right? Love is when you're thinking about others, when you esteem other better than themselves, when you want other people to enjoy, you want other people to be encouraged, you want other people to have the better portion. That's what love is. And if, hey, if you implement this in your marriage, it will revolutionize your marriage. Rather than thinking, I am not enjoying this. I never get it. He never does anything for me. She never does anything for me. If instead you shift your focus to esteeming other better than themselves and you are both trying to serve each other, that is the sort of marriage that you want. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And look at this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So you see, it starts first here. Your perspective and your mind and then your actions will follow. And the mind we are trying to emulate is the same mind of Jesus Christ. And that's why I find that passage in John 13 so profound that this is the love that Jesus is telling, telling us about. Not only serving one another, but even willing to lay down our lives for one another. You know, we talk about husband and wife laying down you know, husband laying down their life, their life for their wives. But you know, the Bible also exhausts that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is something that is expected of all of us. Have you ever thought about that before? I don't know how many of us would be willing to do that. Would you be willing to lay down your life, to put your life on the line for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Now that's a pretty high calling. That ought to humble you to think, man, I am so far from what Jesus expects me to be. You know, that's, that's the standard. That's what Jesus calls of us. That's what Jesus expects of us. But how many of us make that standard? But by the grace of God, we are what we are. John 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Look at this. Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus was not just one to talk the talk. He walked the walk. He says, hey, the greatest love that somebody can have for another human being is to give up their life for them. And not only is he saying that, but he did it for us. Thank God.
Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So that's the standard. But today I want to just talk about some practical ways that we can love one another. You know, I want our church to grow in love. You know, I want the barriers to break down. I want people to interact with one another and be involved in each other's lives. So I want to encourage you today. You know, we are called to love one another, especially they of the household of faith. Right? Do good to all men, especially of those of the household of faith. So, so much more so if we're going to love people in the world. We ought to love people in this church even more so. So ask yourself, when you think about the people you love in your life, are they mainly outside of church or inside of church? When you think about that, you say, well, all my closest friends and all my loved ones, none of them are in this church. You love them so much more. But the Bible actually says the opposite. The Bible says, hey, you do good to all men, but especially of those who are of the household of faith. You know, there's meant to be a special place in your heart for the people of God, the family of God, because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. You love his people, even more so than you love those in the world. Right? So we love everybody. Right? We don't love as many people as we can. Right? Obviously, there are some people we shouldn't love. I'm not saying we love absolutely everybody. We love as many people as we can, but we have a special place in our heart for the people and for the family of God. So five things today, five ways we can love one another. Now the first thing you have to do is you have to consider one another. It has to be a thought in your mind first of all. To even think, like do, like, do you even think, man, I, I need to grow in love. Because sometimes we're so distracted with the world, the things of the world and the things we have to do, that we don't even spare a thought of what we are expected to do as Christians. You know, like some people, they don't even think about church until it's Sunday. And then they decide in bed, am I going to wake up and go to church? It's just the same with loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. You've got to think about it first. You've got a purpose in your heart first, like Daniel. You've got a purpose in your heart first. Like, hey, this is something you're going to do, otherwise you'll never do it. Yeah. Hebrews 10, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So what are we considering? We're not just thinking about each other and thinking, oh man, that guy's got it tough. That lady's got it tough. Oh man, I, I, it sucks to be them. <laughs> I hate to be in their shoes. Is that how we're thinking about each other? Man, I heard this thing, this church, this, this, like, I'm glad it's not me. You know? Or are you thinking about how to provoke unto love and good works? Think about the word provoke. It's how do you spur somebody on? How do you get them excited? What are you going to do to change them to get them to grow? And if everybody in our church thought that way, how that would re revolutionize our church. If everybody was thinking about, hey, how do I provoke somebody else in the church to love and good works, as opposed to provoke them to anger. <laughs> you know? So you don't want to provoke people to anger, you want to provoke them unto love and to good works. And if our church considered that more, how that would change this church. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So you see here that we assemble together, because this is where it starts. You're part of this assembly. You're part of this community. So do you understand what a church is? You guys need to realize that church is not something that you tick off on your spiritual to-do list because a lot of people treat church that way a lot of people think yeah church i did that you know, i went sunday i went to church i did the church thing i ticked it off on my list that's not what church is church is not a religious ritual that you just go along to and now you feel a little more spiritual church is a community that you are a part of one thing that community does is assemble together for singing and preaching and eating together. But that's not where it ends. right? It's a community that you're a part of, that you provoke unto love and good works, that you love one another, that you are helping one another, encouraging each other in the faith. So do you understand what a church is? It's not just meant to be something you tick off on the spiritual to-do list. Do you think about other people at church? Do you realize that you are part of something greater 
that you are part of something bigger than just yourself. And this is something you need to consider. So when you look around the room, guys, when you look around the room, do you know everyone here? Like, do you know, like, really know everybody? If you know everybody here, you might know, oh, yeah, that person's related to this person. Oh, I know that person. Yeah, I've seen them. You know, it always saddens me when I'm talking to somebody at church and I mention somebody's name and they don't know who I'm talking about. You know, I have to say, well, this, but, and it's like, man, like, how long have you been coming to church? You should have went and said hello to that person. You know? Like, I know when you join, it's like, I, like I'm in soccer, right? Like, my kids are in soccer. And sometimes, I get it. It's like, in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a sports club. You sit there and the parents just stick to themselves. Everyone, all the parents are on their phone because the kids are all doing stuff. That's not what church should be like. Church shouldn't be like you come here every week and there's somebody, you know, sometimes, I don't know if you guys take your kids to things yet. You, take, you see somebody every week and you, and you, you know each other because you know each other's there. You've seen each other, you've passed each other. But for some reason you just don't say hello. You have been like that sometimes? Like I had to work too. So I try and make it a point. You know what, I'm just going to say hello, just break the ice. At least introduce myself. So when I sit next to somebody, sometimes at jiu-jitsu or soccer, I just go, hey, my name's Victor. <laughs> and then at least you've said hello, you've introduced yourself, and then it's not so awkward every time you go, just walking past each other. So you don't want to be like that at church. You know, church, you know, you want to, you actually call to love one another. You're not just here for an activity that somebody else is doing, like your kids, and then you can just stick to yourself at soccer or jiu-jitsu and just go on your phone and then leave later on. That's not what church is like. Church, you're here, your job as a Christian, your expectation as a Christian, like we saw before, to provoke unto love and good work, is to come and think, man, I want to be an encouragement to somebody today. Is that what you thought today when you came to church? Or did you think, man, I hope Victor preaches something interesting today. Oh man, his sermons have been so boring. You know, I hope Victor preaches something that helps me, applicable to me. You know, I hope somebody's nice to me today. I go there, everybody says hello to me. You know, that, that's the sort of attitude people have when they come to church. You want to come to church and think, you know what, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to be a blessing to somebody today. I'm going to make somebody smile today. I'm going to ask about somebody today. I'm going to meet somebody that I haven't met today. You know, that's the sort of idea. Like, hey, I want to meet somebody and I can invite them over sometime. You know, so we want to have that sort of attitude at church. And this is one way you can love each other. And it's a, you should ought to be, feel some shame. If you've been coming to this church, all of you guys have been coming to this church for quite some time. If you look around the room and there's somebody in this room that you don't know very well, shame on you. You know, that you have not taken the time to even say hello, introduce yourself, talk to them. You know, this is, um, I ought to, you have to feel some shame and think, man, like I am not playing my part in the body of Christ. Uh, you don't, you're not considering the community that you're a part of. Um, do you notice when someone is not here? That's considering one another to provoke unto love and good works. When somebody doesn't come to church, do you notice that they're not there? Or you're only thinking about yourself? See? So yeah, I try, to, I try and encourage people to, who have been out of church for a while. I'll send them a text every now and then, hey, I haven't seen you in church. Hey, if more of us did that, how much stronger would our church be? You know, so you never know how you're going to encourage people. Some people are encouraged by the bishop texting them and saying, hey, where are you? Hey, it's nice. That other people are like, oh, man, this guy keeps bugging me. But you know what? If you message them, maybe they'd be like, hey, you know what? Like, they'd be encouraged. You don't know. See, I don't know always sometimes when people are going to be encouraged or discouraged by me. You don't know either. Right? So that's why we, all, we have to all encourage one another. You don't know the part you play in the body. You know? And like I try and encourage everybody, but if everybody did that, man, how much stronger would this body be? Ephesians 4, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom, look at this, the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplier, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So I know I read this verse a lot because, hey, repetition is the key to learning. And I know if you're saying like, Victor, you know, why do you just keep saying the same verses again and again and again and showing the same verses? Because I want you guys to get this. But I feel like it hasn't been grasped yet. And I feel like when you grasp it, you realize the importance of this, then you'll be like, ah, 
That's why Victor kept saying it, because it was so important, because it was made a difference. You know, my place in the body of Christ and the part that I play in terms of making this body strong, making this body grow, edifying the body of itself in love. Because how many people think that the job of edification and the job of encouragement is only for church leadership? Like, it's not only my job. I try and set the example. I'm trying to show you guys. I'm not doing it so that you guys don't have to do it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, when I text people and I'm encouraging people, I've been trying to invite people over, try and catch up with people. I'm doing it to set the example because this is how I want you guys to be. It's not, therefore, oh, Victor's got it covered. Therefore, I don't have to do it. Do you get what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to set the example. Say, hey, that's how Victor behaves. That's how Victor treats people in church. I should treat people like ch in church the same way. You know, that's what I'm trying to, to show. And I'm not saying I'm a perfect example. You guys know that. I'm not so proud to think I've got it all covered. But I'm trying to lead the way, show you guys, hey, this is how I would like everyone to treat one another and how to, everyone to be involved. So just think about, you know, you, you may think, oh, yeah, but Victor, you just know everybody because you're the bishop. That's why you know everybody. And, it, and if only you knew how false that is. Because I have, to make, I have to make time to get to know people as well. Because even in my life, I've found people can come to this church and I don't always know them that well because I've just been busy or I haven't taken the time to get to know them. And it's the same thing with me. Like if I don't take the time to have somebody over or talk to them, like I'm not going to know them that well either. So don't think that it just automatically happens as a bishop. Like oh, you just when you're a bishop, things just automatically happen. You just know everyone intimately, automatically. No, it takes work. And it's the sort of work that I'm doing that I want to show you guys, hey, I want you guys to do it too, and it'll change how our church operates. All right, so you need to first consider one another. Second of all, thinking about each other. Second of all, you want to learn about each other. And I know that takes effort too. It's easy, it's a fleshly thing to think, ah, oh, you know, I can't be bothered really getting to know other people. I know enough, you know, you'll say to yourself, I know enough people already. Right? You might say, like, ah, oh, I've got enough friends, we've got it covered. Right? That's not a spiritual state of mind. That's not where God wants us to be. You know, we should be striving to, to meet more people, learn more about, learn more about the people you do know. You know, maybe you know people, but you don't know them that well. I mean, I am still learning new things about people that have been at our church, like, for years. You know, I was just like, really? Like, you didn't, I had no idea. No idea you did that. You know? James 1, look at this. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to run. Swift to hear. So it doesn't mean you can't talk at all, but our attitude should be, hey, we're, we're listening first. We're learning first. So listen to understand. You know, don't just wait for your turn to talk. Now, people always say that. You know, when, you, when you're silent and you're talking to somebody, are you just waiting for your turn to talk or are you actually listening to what they're saying? So listen to understand. Not just, don't just wait for your turn to talk. Understand why they're saying what they're saying. This is what they say. You're swift to hear. You're trying to understand why are they saying the things they're saying rather than just what they're saying and running with your own understanding of what they're saying. So you need to realize it's not just the words people use, but it's also what they mean. Now you need to talk to somebody to know what they're thinking. Right? So this is why I always mention, you know, I am not a proponent of people that say, well, women just have this women's intuition because right? that's just women trying to read things that aren't necessarily said. It's always better if somebody says something, now you know what they're thinking. Um, women's intuition is just women assuming that they know what that person is thinking when they may not really know what they are thinking. So don't, don't assume that you know what people are thinking. It's always best to talk with people. If you don't know this, how do you spell assume? Make an ass out of you and me. Right? That's how you spell assume. So try to assume less. I assume a lot too. Sometimes I assume things and I make a fool of myself too. So um, assume less. The more you talk, the more you hear. 
when, we, when you're conversing with people, the more you hear, the less you'll assume, right? And the, and the, the better you'll be at learning about people. Let's look at some other verses about talking. Proverbs 20, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Ain't that the truth? People love talking about themselves, don't they? That's why it's easy to have a conversation with people. Most people, you know, it, it takes some like, maturity to get to the point where you can sit and you can listen to somebody. And you're listening and learning about that person. But most baby Christians, they can just talk, they just talk, 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 and they, or they just talk about themselves. But that's why it's easy to get to know people, because you just start asking some questions, and you can get somebody talking about themselves. Usually, that turns out to be a very good conversation. So sometimes I, I'll have conversations with people, and I'll do very little talking, but that person will go away thinking, oh, that was a great conversation. Victor. But it's just because if you just listen and just ask some questions and relate to some things, if you learn that skill, then you can have a conversation with anybody. And people, and that's how you can be friendly as well, when you learn to listen more than talk. Because most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. People like to talk about themselves. Um, and that's a, that's a natural trait of the flesh, right? So when you talk to them and you talk about themselves, um, they like that. Proverbs 29. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? Look at this. There is more hope of a fool than of him. Man, that is a great reminder to all of us. Somebody that's hasty, you, you answer very quickly, you speak too quickly. The Bible says, hey, there's more hope of a fool than of that person. That ought to tell you how, how dangerous it is to not be careful with your words. Proverbs 18. So we talk about learning about people, you know, that's one way you can love your brothers and sisters in Christ is to know more about them. I mean, don't you feel loved when somebody knows more things about you? You know, it's like when people say when you remember their birthday or whatever, like when people know things about you, don't you feel like, hey, that person loves me more than the person that knows nothing about me? So if you know about people, you know what their interests are, you know their struggles, you know, that's going to help in other areas as well. It'll help in how you give advice, right? We're going to provoke unto love and good works. People like to give advice too. They like to share like what they've learned and say, hey, look, I've done this and whatever. The Bible says here, he that answereth, um, answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So we talk about listening, being swift to hear, right? Slow to speak, slow to wrath. It's the same. We should hear first before we answer. Sometimes you see people in a situation. This happens a lot. You know, you see people in a situation, you're quick to give your opinion, quick to give your advice. What I recommend is, why not find out why they're in that situation first? Maybe there's a reason why it's like that. You know, maybe it's not what you're assuming it is to be, right? So you should answer, you should hear it before you answer a matter. You should be swift to hear. So when you learn about people, not only will they feel love, but when you learn more about them, it'll change the way you give advice as well. Because now you'll give it with a bit more compassion. Now you'll share things. You may refrain because you think, you know what? I understand now why they do it that way. I'm not going to be so hard on them. So like I said, that will change how our church interacts, how you interact with other people. If you are swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to write. Proverbs 27. Now there is a place for correction. See, there's a place for advice. But look here, open rebuke is better than secret love. That's always interesting, right? The Bible's saying here, hey, it's better for somebody that you love, or somebody that loves you, know that you're doing something wrong than for them to you know, love you so much and you know nothing about it, right? Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Now this is obviously talking about spiritually, right? Not physical wounds, like actually hurting somebody. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now why have I underlined friend here? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Because you have to be a friend first in, in order to feel like you can wound somebody. Right? So that's why you have to be very careful when you give advice and we're very careful when you correct people 
right? Because there needs to be a, a relationship established there first. And that's why when you consider one another, you learn about people, you spend time, you love them. That'll then give you the right to be able to correct them without them being hurt. So if you think here, it's faithful are the wounds of a friend. Because, you know, often the wounds of an acquaintance, somebody you don't know that well, can be hurtful. Right? So you need to be careful. Don't just say, hey, well, I'm going to tell this person what I think because I love them so much. Right? You've got to ask yourself first, are we good friends? Can we be considered friends? Because then only will my wound be faithful. But if we don't know each other that well, we're not that good friends, then... I need to be careful with my words because they can do a lot of hurt and they can, and they can cause a lot of strife in a church. You know, some people leave church for doctrinal reasons. You know, maybe they, maybe they leave because they don't agree with something and that's, that's, that's fine. That's a good reason to leave a church, right? If you don't agree with something, if you can't support it, then you find somewhere that you can plug in and support and get behind. But you know, most people leave church, they don't leave church for scriptural reasons most people leave church because of relationship issues yeah. right most people leave a church because somebody said something and they got offended somebody did something and they should have known better somebody didn't say hello to me that church wasn't very friendly if you were to ask most people why they went from one church to another i'd say most people and obviously this is just anecdotal but most people and maybe in your own experience when you think about people they leave because of how they were treated Know, something so that's why it's so important for us to love one another um, because that that really can make be, be the difference between somebody sticking in church and growing and going on to serve the lord and somebody getting out of church because of just being offended you know because they're a babe in christ you know should should they be should they have been offended no should they just grow and just take it of course but that's not the reality guys and that's why we have to be very careful with how we treat people, how we love one another, how we show love to people that come to our church because it, it'll make a difference in their spiritual life. Big difference of whether they stick with it or not. Now this goes on to my third point. When you talk with people, you get to know them, you're swift to hear, you will pray for them better as well because now you'll know what to pray for. You know, when you pray... Like we, we talk about um, being selfless and how we are to love each other. Being selfless, thinking about others. When you pray, think about the last time you prayed. If you can't remember the last time you prayed, shame on you. <laughs> so I don't even know the last time I did pray. Yeah. But if the, when you think about the last time you prayed, who did you pray for? Did you only pray for you? God, like, I need to find a job. God, like, this person is, like, being so annoying to me. Take them out of my life. <laughs> God, like, you know, I, I need my business to succeed. I haven't had a holiday in three months. You know? Is it selfish prayers? Or are you praying for others? Let's look at some of the people praying in the Bible. Ephesians 1. This is Paul. Oh, we'll look at Paul's prayer. I've mainly got Paul as an example here. Ephesians 1, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, look at this, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, not only here is he not ceasing to pray for his brothers and sisters in Christ, look at what he's praying for. So you read these passages in the Bible, you can get, I don't know what to pray for people. Maybe if you don't know, like that's what I'm saying. You may learn about somebody, You've got some specific prayer requests. But if you don't know what to pray for other people, here's some good ideas about what to pray for people. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, look at this, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. You're praying for people to be wise, have more wisdom in how they live their life. And revelation in the knowledge of Him, understanding more. Look at this, the eyes of of your understanding being enlightened you see that's one thing you can pray for other people saying like i hope people see god for what he really is see the spiritual life that the light would turn on Amen. and go ah 
man, I get it now. I know what I should be doing. I've got to change. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. What does that mean? That you now see clearly through the Bible what life is about. Is that what you're praying for people? You're praying for people, like for God to get a hold of people's heart and go, God, get a hold of this person's heart so they will stop living for the world. That you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. See what Paul was praying for? Paul's praying for people to grow in the Lord. And you know why people don't pray for others to grow in the Lord? Because they're not trying to grow themselves. You know, you, you, it'd be weird to sit and pray and go, I hope this person's spiritual life is growing and you have no interest yourself in growing in the Lord. So if you're wondering why you don't pray for other people's spiritual growth, it's because you, you need to grow yourself. You know, get in a spiritual mindset. When you start considering your own spiritual life, you'll start considering the spiritual life of others. Right? Philippians 1. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. See, when he thinks about the believers in Jesus Christ, is he like, oh man, can I go see those guys again? No, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. When I think about, man, I'm in a Bible-believing church. This is great. That ought to be our mindset. Man, there's somewhere I can go and there's people that believe like I do. And I'm reminded that I'm not alone in this spiritual life. Thank God for that. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You say, Paul, why were you so confident that Jesus was going to work in the lives of these believers? Even as it is meet, suitable for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. So Paul is saying, hey, because I have you in my heart, hey, he also knows they're going through what he's going through. I'm confident that Jesus will do a work in you until the day. For God is my record. Look at that. God is my record. See, God knows whether you're praying or not. So you may fool you, you may fool the people at church in how spiritual you are, but you don't fool God. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's something for us all to reflect on. You know, you can fool how spiritual you are on the outside, but can you say this? Can you say, God is my record that I'm praying for other people, that I'm trying to serve Him in spirit and in truth? Can you say that? You want to be able to say that. You can say that if you take the things of God seriously. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And look at this. Look at what he's praying. We're getting some ideas of what to pray for. Him. This I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So he's praying for them to grow. He's praying for them to get the sin out of their life being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise and God, of God. Why ultimately? So that God is glorified. You know, we want God to be glorified. That's why we serve Him. That's why we want to pray for others to serve Him. Because we want God to get as much glory as possible. Because He's worthy. Second Thessalonians 3. And of course, you can ask for prayer of yourself too. There's nothing wrong with that. So you, know, you talk to it, you learn about them, you know now what to pray for, you can pray for other things, but also you can share. You will get more comfortable sharing your things. Hey, pray for me in this area too. I want things to pray for. The closer you are with other people. You know, and that's a, uh, this is how you can love each other. You know, how can you love each other? You pray for each other. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. So you're praying for protection for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, number four. 
Number four. You know, we don't want to just love in word, but in deed and in truth. So how can you love one another? Is when you actually do things for each other. You do things for each other. First John 3, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's a tough one. That is a tough one. <laughs> Can you say that? Man, I am willing to die for my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not just husbands. You know, we think about husbands dying for their wives. No, we meant to be willing to risk our lives for the brethren. And one day that may come. You know, where you may have to sacrifice yourself to save other people. Will you be willing to do that? By God's grace, hopefully we will. But whoso had this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. He's saying if, if you see somebody who has a need, and you have the, a way to fulfill that need, and you do not fulfill it, God is saying, how, how, does, how is the love of God in you? So you can't say you love God and that you see your brother have need and do nothing about it when it is in your power to do something about it. That's what the Bible is saying here. How dwelleth the love of God in you? Saying, hey, the love, basically, the love of God is not dwelling in you. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So yes, praying for each other is good. Praying for each other makes a difference. God can work in that person's life. But if there is a need that you can see, that you can do, you don't just pray about it. You do it. That's why you don't just love just in word. Man, pray that this person help, gets help. But if you can help, you help. 1 John 4, look at this. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Let me ask you, do you love God? Then ask yourself the question, do you love your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ? And the Bible's saying here that you can't say that you love God if you can't even love somebody you can see. You see, you're a liar if you don't love your brother. If you hate your brother and you say you love God, you don't actually love God. So you see how your love for the brethren is a litmus test on whether or not you actually love God. So you can't say you love God if you don't love your fellow brother and sister in Christ. Right? So this is how, so this is how you do it. Because loving your brothers and loving the body of Christ is a practical way of how we actually love God. So when we do things for one another, that's how we can love one another. And there's plenty of ways you can help people. You can help one another and ways you encourage them. Um, but let me ask you this, like, how do you know their needs if you don't know anything about them? Right? You've got to know about, no, you've got to get to know them, to know what their needs are in order to do something to help someone. So you might, you know, obviously there's the obvious of buying somebody a gift. You know, you might buy something for somebody, you know, um, that might help them with something or something that you know they need. You buy, that, buy it for them um, or you help them out with some funds. Or maybe a more uh, practical thing would just be you make them some food. You know, I don't think anybody, I mean, have you ever had somebody make you something and you just go, I can't believe they did that? You know, like if somebody made, like, you know, you're making some sweets at home, you say, you know what, I'm going to bring some for the people at church. I'm going to bring some for this person and give it to them. Just lighten up their day. When have you ever received some home-baked goodies and just thought, you know, every time you get it, you think, man, this is great. My day just got a little bit brighter. <laughs> a little bit more sugary. But... You know what I mean? Like just the small things. But when we do things like that for each other, this is how we encourage one another. 
some really practical ways, or some ways I really like done in this church, just having people over for dinner. You know, I think when you have people over for dinner, you know, you make a point, hey, I don't know this person, let's have them over for dinner. Let's get to know them. And let's just talk and just, uh, just ask each other about your past and just, just talk. Just get to know one another. That'll change your interactions at church. Or maybe invite them out with your group. You know, are you the type that have your own group and you have your clique and you have a group, so you're fine. Right? And this is what happens with cliques. And this is why cliques are not very good. You need to expand your cliques. Because you may have a group of, like, say, five to ten people, and you have a circle of friends. And you think, well, I'm fine, because every time I go out, I've got people to hang out with. But what about other people in church? Do they feel the same? One way you can show church love is when you do something, you include other people. You say, hey, come along with us. You know, feel included. You know, wouldn't you like that? Nobody wants to be the person on the soccer team or the football team where it's like you know, the last draft. <laughs> you know what I mean? So sometimes it's like that in competitive sports. But when it comes to the Christian life, it ought not be like that. We want to include as many people as possible. Have everybody part of the team. Okay, last one. Last one. How to love one another. We love one another by the example that we set. Right? We love each other by the example that we set. You may not think that. You may not think that the way you live, you know, because we've been talking about things that affect other people, right? You do something for somebody, you pray for somebody else, you know, you consider them. But the way you live your life and the example that you set is loving your fellow brother and sister in Christ. Because why? Because it encourages other people, refreshes other people, and it'll set a good example for their children. Aren't you appreciative of good examples for your children? When you think, oh, you know, you may take, like I take them to like soccer, and I like the soccer coach, right? I think like, you know, he's, he's, just, a, he's just a decent guy, right? So I think, hey, I'm, I'm glad he's a good example to the children. He's not swearing, he's not vulgar, he's kind, he's, you know, that sort of thing. So just you having a good character is loving to your fellow brother and sister in Christ. First Timothy 4. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So it doesn't matter on your age. You can be an example to everybody in the body of Christ, young or old. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in charity, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. God wants us to be an example to the believers. We need to start thinking more about our effect on others, right? And our effect on the next generation. You know, oftentimes, if you think more about the next generation, they, that may be a bigger motivator for you to change than just thinking about yourself. And, and also give you reasons to change that you may not apply to yourself. Um, and I was, you know, I was talking to somebody recently, and, we're talk sometimes, and this often comes up as well, in the topic of clothing, and in the topic of dating standards, right? Where you may think, oh, you know, there's nothing wrong with me wearing this, but if you think, would I want my daughter? Would I send my daughter to a party in what I'm wearing? You might think, no way, Jose. Well, if you think that, then you ought to think, maybe I need to change the way I dress. Or you may think, well, I'm dating this girl, right? Would I want a guy treating my daughter the way I treat this girl? That might change the way you treat a girl as well. So you see how if you think about your example, if you think about how you live affecting other people, how it's going to affect the next generation. Would you want your own children doing that? That's going to change how you behave. So you need to think of others. We serve with joy. Have I shown you this, this before? I think I have. This is a good way to remember how you should serve. In what priority? So J, what does J stand for? Jesus. Jesus. We serve with joy. What's O? Others. Others. Right? And what's why? What's last? You. 
Right, so you serve with joy. It's always a good way to remember it. Remember your priorities. Jesus first, others second. You last, esteem other better than yourself. Some people, joy, some people serve with yodge. Right, they have it the other way around. Serve with yodge because they're always serving themselves. And then they think of other people. And then when there's time, then in time for Jesus. All right, so serve with joy. Don't serve with yodge. All right, second John. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Look at this. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. See, if you are not keeping the commandments of God, if you're not at church, you're not loving your brother and sister in Christ because you're not setting the example you ought to set. If you say, hey, I love my brother and sister in Christ, but I'm not involved in church at all. I'm not involved in the things of God at all. How are you loving your brother and sister in Christ when, when to love is to walk in God's commandments? If you're constantly living in defiance of God's commandments, how dwelleth the love of God in you? 1 John 5, look, by this we know that we love the children of God this when we love God and keep his commandments you see that that's how you love each other when you love when you strive to keep God's commandments that is you loving your brother and sister in Christ even though it's mainly focused on your own growth but see but your own growth has an effect on other people for this is the love of God look at this that we keep his commandments and this is the point you want to grow to and his commandments are not grievous. You say, Victor, if you say things like that, people just do it for you. Yeah, well, you've got to keep the commandments first. But hopefully you get to the point where you keep the commandments and the commandments are not grievous. Right? You want to do it as opposed to you have to do it. So this is how we love. You know, this is how you can provoke unto love and good works. So when you do it yourself, you provoke other people are to love and good works. Why? Because of the example you set. When you set a good example, you may not know this, but you are refreshing to those, those other, uh, other people who are also trying to live for the Lord. Amen. Did you know that? Yeah. See, for maybe for some of you, you're not used to being the one that's at the front. You're not used to being the one that's trying to pull others along. Right? Because you're always being pulled along. But I tell you what, when you're one of the ones, when you grow to one of the ones, I'm not just talking about myself. I'm talking about when you get to, to be one of the ones where you're trying, you're, you've got the right frame of mind now, and you're trying to pull people up. You're trying to pull people up, encourage people. Hey, man, you didn't see you at church. Hey, let's get serving more. You know, what have you learned in the Bible recently? I'm talking about this topic. Hey, I was reading this. When you're that sort of person and you see another person living for God, that refreshes you. That's encouraging. Right? That's why it's important that we are all serving the Lord. Look at this in 1 Corinthians 16. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia. And look at this, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. What a way to phrase serving God. You know, we talk, when we think about addiction, we think about an uncontrollable desire to want to do or to consume something. And the Bible here is commending those in this house of Stephanus and saying like, man, submit yourselves to these people. We're talking to the Corinthians, these people. These guys have addicted themselves to the ministry. That's what they live for. That's what they want. That's what, that's what they crave. That's the sort of love and desire we ought to serve God with. Not a Man, I just do my time. I just do it because I have to. Where we want to get to is, man, that's like, I can't live without it. Like, if I don't have it, I need it. I need to serve God. I need to get to that point. This is the example here. And they have addicted themselves to the ministry. That ye submit yourselves unto such. So he's saying, hey, follow their example, right? And he's sending them there and he's saying, hey, obey them, basically, how they are going to tell you to behave. And to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Archaicus, for that which was lacking in your part they have supplied. Look at this. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. 
Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. You think the Apostle Paul, greatest disciple that ever lived, man, greatest encourager that ever lived, man of God, you know, did wonders, did miracles. This man needed to be encouraged? Yep, he did. And when he heard of believers work walking in the Lord, he heard of people addicting themselves to the ministry, he goes, man, I was refreshed. You know, so you see how your example that you set as a believer can have an effect on somebody else. The way you come to church, the way you serve God may make somebody go flat or may make somebody go, you know what, hey, renew their spirit, refresh them and go, hey, this is, this is good. Philemon, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. So this is an example of Paul. See, Paul didn't just pray for people generally, which is sometimes, sometimes you pray like that. You know, you pray for people generally, hey, just pray for people at church, pray for this, pray, you know, it's a general prayer of a group of people, right? But not only that, see, Paul prays specifically for an individual, because when he's writing to Philemon, he says, I thank my God, making mention of thee, singular, always in my prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. You see how Paul not only thinks about groups, he's not just thinking about the churches, he's praying for individuals in those churches. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation. What's consolation? Comfort. When you console somebody in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So you see how you can have an effect on a large group of people. Because he says the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So you see how your example, your walk in the Christian life can have a profound effect on a number of people. So if you think about that, what if you're a bad example? You can affect a number of people too. Right? So that's why you want to make sure you're a good example so that you do not set a bad example. You'll be provoking unto love and good works. You'll be spiritually refreshing to be around. Now I want to just end on one last thought, one last verse. So we talked about how to love one another. We need to grow in love as believers. Right? There are different ways we can love each other. Just thinking about each other, learning about each other, praying for one another, doing nice things for one another, being an example in your own Christian life. Christian life is how you love one another. I want to leave you on this thought. Luke 6. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of who you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend hoping for nothing, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Now when you think about loving people, do you only consider doing something nice for people that are already nice to you? Jesus says, hey, this is what sinners do. Sinners love those that love them. He says, hey, if you do good to those that do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. You see, so often people do nice things for other people, but they do nice things for people that have done nice things for them. Right? They, they are grateful for people that are grateful for them. But here's a challenge for you. Why don't you try and love somebody that has done nothing for you yet? Well, you don't know that well. You actually start. You are the one that initiates the love, as opposed to only loving 
in return. And when you love, are you upset if you don't get anything in return? That's why the Bible says here, like, if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you for sinners also do the same? Look, look at what it says here. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing. But you say, oh, I, might, I, I don't expect them to give me something back. But you know what sometimes people get upset about? When you do something for somebody and they're not grateful. You think, I can't believe what I did for this. They could not even say thank you. Like, they not, did they not appreciate what I did for them? You know, no record, no, nothing. It's like, that's why the Bible says here, for he is kind unto the unthankful. Because we do that to God all the time, don't we? We don't thank him. So that's the sort of love you should have. You know, don't just love those that love you. Don't just be grateful for those. Don't just do nice things for people you already know. My challenge to you is, you know, when you look, if you look around the room, I don't know all the relationships in this church, but if you look around the room and there's somebody you don't know that well, you know, you could know a bit better. Maybe you don't really have much interaction with them. My challenge to you is to love somebody outside of your clique already. And if we can break down the cliques in this church, we can break down the walls. You know, our church is small enough for people to know everybody. You have no excuse. So I think that will do wonders for our church. Because you know what? If the relationships are strong in this church, that just makes the service to God even stronger and God will get more glory. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, thank you for the challenge. Um, myself also, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that each one of us will love uh, each other here. And, uh, Lord, that we will reach outside of our circles and we will get to know people we don't know that well. Um, so I just pray, Lord, for this and just pray for our church to grow. I know, Lord, that this is what you would want of your church. You want it to be a family, Lord. You want it to be a strong family, a strong community. So I just pray, Lord, that each one of us will recognize that we're part of something greater for the sake of this church and for the sake of the next generations. So, um, Lord, help us. We need your grace. We, we come short of this standard. So we need you to help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.